What is up, ladies and gentlemen? You're looking at me right now like Brick Tamlin. You're not a Aaron. I am not. I'm Jake Tato, co uh, substituting as host here. We got an exciting match on our uh, stack here. But first, you know, check out the recent matches. Um, we've got a lot of the 2023 tournament matches that have been dropping recently, as well as the recently uploaded Westerns exhibition. Moving on to today's events, introducing first, we have Joshua Diggins here. Greetings. Hi. Hey, how you doing? Josh here failed to qualify for the tournament with his last match, but comes in off the back of a good showing in the previously mentioned Westerns exhibition. And you already have a KO victory. So how are you feeling about today? Um, I feel good about today. Uh, it's an interesting question list. I'm ready to fight. Uh, the exhibition definitely uh, helped a lot. Uh, just being able to, you know, at least dive into something that I knew. You know, I feel like I know fairly well, and um, you know, just test my chops against others. It wasn't a serious match. I genuinely thought it was. I forgot it was an ex ex exhibition. I was about to say expedition. Can't say anything today. <laughs> Anyways, um, now nah, I'm hoping to go in and come out with a win. I'm hoping to go in uh, fighting hard, come out victorious. Um, Alejandro is a good guy, so let's see what we've got. All right, all right. We'll drop you back here and introducing his opponent, Alejandro, also coming in after failing just barely to qualify for that tournament. Uh, the season is far from over for you. You got a lot of exhibitions on you on the stack, but this is your last regular season match. How are you feeling? I'm actually feeling pretty good, even after my loss uh, the last time. It was, yeah, it sucks to lose, but also it was kind of cool to do the job for Will, as it were, you know, at WrestleSpeak. But uh, I'm always looking forward, you know, never looking back. I'm excited to face Josh, a fellow actor, fellow thespian, uh, fellow stage entertainer. So I'm stoked to get to the, to these questions because I think, I think we're going to have some pretty specific opinions about them. All righty. All righty. With that said, we will move on to question number one here in the movie Battleground. And that question. Oops, sorry. I forgot. I think I'm on screen for this part. <laughs> um, all right. This is why Aaron normally has to not me. All right. Again. Hosting's hard. All righty. Going on to question number one in this wonderful matchup here. What is the best film in... Sorry, sorry, sorry. Who's going first? I believe it's Alejandro. I will be going first on this one. Mm -hmm. Once again, we will count it back in. <laughs> <laughs> Judges, you guys are awesome. Thank you for bearing with me. Um, thank you, players. Definitely having a great time so far. All right. Five, four, three, two, one. All right. Going first on question number one, we have Alejandro. And the question is, what is the best film featuring Clint Eastwood released in the 1980s? True. And just to make sure I've got the... Oh, got to present the button. I forgot. Like I, can't, I came in and out, so I lost the video file. Yay me! I'm a hero. <laughs> You're my hero. Academia. Thanks, hey, that's a show. <laughs> hold, hold. Give it a second. Lagging, lagging. All righty. All righty. Your first question of this match. We have Alejandro going first here. What is the best film featuring Clint Eastwood released in the 1980s? Your 60 seconds when you begin speaking. Something that people might not know about me is I'm actually 
big Western fan, particularly I'm a fan of Clint Eastwood, uh, barring, of course, that that one time he went nuts. But that's besides the point. Uh, when you ask about the best Clint Eastwood film in the 1980s, it's kind of like asking about the best wrestling match in the 2010s. There's slim pickings. But uh, for me, when you think about Clint Eastwood, you either think of two things. You either think of Western movies or you think of Dirty Harry. So for this question, the best film, in my opinion, for uh, Clint Eastwood from the 80s would have to be Sudden Impact, the fourth installment in the Dirty Harry franchise. It's It was a sequel that nobody asked for, but somehow managed to capture the intensity and uh, just overall awesomeness of Clint Eastwood as Harry Callahan. Uh, it's kind of generic, but for 1983, it was really uh, one of the best action movies of that decade, in my opinion. Um, I do think that uh, Clint Eastwood has better movies, but being in the window of the 1980s, this one has to be, I think, the best. Even if it's not the most critically acclaimed, it's the most entertaining, and it's the most Clint Eastwood of the 1980s movies. And time. And your 60 seconds when you begin, sir. Well, when it comes to a decade known as the 80s, considering the fact that I was just watching something as campy but fun as Young Guns, um, you know, Clint Eastwood, one of the great actors, one of the great directors of, well, all time, really. Um, I believe that when you think of Eastwood, you know, you do think of the gunslinger. Obviously, people think of Dirty Harry, Dirty Harry as well. And those are the two movies that he had in the 80s. But I don't believe that Sudden Impact is the one that should be crowned king of the uh, Eastwood 80s films. I believe that goes to Pale Rider. Um, you know, the, the film is about uh, just a man. It, it, it's essentially the 80s version of Ghost Rider, but told in a much more awesome way. Um uh, you know, this preacher, he just comes out of nowhere into this mining town where people are suffering and he's there to save them. Uh, little girl prayed up to God and he heard her prayers and answered with Clint Eastwood. So I believe Pell Ryder is the best Clint Eastwood film of the 1980s for sure. And time. We will move back to Alejandro for your two minutes when you begin speaking, sir. While I do agree that Pale Rider is a good film, I don't think it's the best of Clint Eastwood in the 1980s. It's certainly not Clint Eastwood's best Western movie. Like when people think of Clint Eastwood and Westerns, they think of like a few dollars for a few dollars more, a fistful of dollars, stuff like that. Pale Rider gets swept under the rug so fast because there are so many better movies. Sudden Impact was, like I say, a sequel that nobody asked for. It came out seven years after the third Dirty Harry movie. This was the fourth one, by the way. They did do a fifth one, but I think that one's lackluster compared to this one. Only because of uh, Sandra Locke or Sandra Lowe. I can't remember her name. She, uh, th This was one of the most... like intense female-led characters like this woman goes on a revenge quest to uh take back her innocence from these people who took it it was it is a sexual assault story but it was one of the first movies i think to ever implement that style of having a female character that is not just a damsel in distress she's she's proactive and she seeks vengeance in the most fiery and intense way and that pairs with clint eastwood's um I don't know what you would call it. That's like stone metal style that he has as Harry Callahan, because he's not a soft character in any way. But this woman brings that out in him. And I think that's what over, uh, sets it over the top for me. Their chemistry is what really sells the movie. Like, yes, the story is cool. The action is intense. And of course, Clint Eastwood as Harry Callahan it brings the badassness to the movie. But the female character specifically, I think that's what sets it over the edge for me. Um, Pale Rider ultimately is just another gunslinger movie, uh, which, again, good movie, but not the best of Clint Eastwood's westerns and certainly not the best of Clint Eastwood in the 1980s. Uh, for me, I just want to see this woman get 
uh, her, or I want, or rather, I want to see this woman give uh, her attackers their comeuppance with Harry Callahan in the background cheering her on. And time. Uh, Joshua, your two minutes when you begin. When it comes to Pale Rider, when it comes to, actually, let me run that back. No, I don't think it's ranked very high among Eastwood's Westerns, although it does hold a 93% on Rotten Tomatoes uh, compared to Sudden Impact, which holds 53%. And we all know that, you know, within recent years, well, within recent weeks, we found out that Rotten Tomatoes isn't as legit as it should be. But still, this is before we found out. So we're going to go off of these legitimate scores here, uh, pre-scandal. So the thing with Pale Rider is that it was based on... Um, based on one of the passages out of Revelation, behold, a pale horse and the rider was deaf. And essentially, that, that is who Clint Eastwood is playing. He's one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse coming in to save this small mining company, this small town from this, um, well, this bigger mining company that wants to come in and take over. Uh, pretty much the story of you know freedom versus land barons and how individuals think that just because they can have something because they can afford it, they should be able to uh, and, and do it as they please. But Clint Eastwood comes up with, hey, no, stop, that's not happening. And he comes and brings death to all of them. Granted, now with sudden impact at the same time, though, yes, there is much death. Yes, it is a story of sexual assault, but the movie is poorly written. It's not really well directed. It's actually one of Eastwood's not so critically acclaimed uh, directorial debut films. It's just no one really talks about it. As you said, it's a sequel that nobody asked for. And because it's a sequel that nobody asked for, it's something that nobody really ever much talks about. I mean, you hear more of Pale Rider upon the lips of man as opposed to that of Sudden Impact. And the sudden impact of Sudden Impact was 53% on Rotten Tomatoes, just poor writing, not really well done. The original director wasn't even uh, also tied to it as well. So, I mean, that, that can bl explain a lot of things. But Pale Rider, it, it shows itself approved. It has come to the throne of God and it has made itself known and it says hey listen I believe and I believe in Pell Rider I just don't believe in sudden impact and I bide my time all righty um, good stuff there we will move into the four minute opening whenever any player begins speaking I think Alejandro where we clearly differ look look we, we both love Eastwood. We, it's clear that we are both Eastwood fans, for sure. Right. Uh, to me, I believe Unforgiveness is best work. And yeah. be best okay. picture winner. Come on now. Yeah. But, right. when, but when we think about it, you know, obviously we know Clint Eastwood for being that great gun, gunslinger. Um, and I think that he just, he plays the role very, very well, obviously with different characters. And he, you know, he kind of plays it in similar ways, but um, also makes them different in unique ways. But opposed with Dirty Harry, just overall as a film, it just does not shine or stand out as the others or the original. And I just believe that Pell Rider in every way just seems to be better. I disagree. Only because, like, Clint, uh, Harry Callahan is a modern-day cowboy. Like, that's why you get Clint Eastwood is because he is the sheriff in town trying to keep order. Uh, I do want to say, like, uh, even though I don't think it's less popular uh, than Pale Rider because Dirty Harry, the series, is going to be more popular than Pale Rider long after this. Uh, no, of course, the original director's name isn't on it because he didn't finish the movie. Like they didn't, uh, they didn't complete the project. Clint Eastwood is actually credited for directing some of this movie for that reason. I, I think that's why this is the best Clint Eastwood movie from the '80s, specifically because yes, Unforgiven is obviously his best movie. But when we're in the window of the 1980s and we have this uh, pile to choose from, I have to go with Sudden Impact. Even though the fifth movie did also come out in the '80s, but I think it's just a little bit lower than Sudden Impact. It came out seven years after the third movie, like that is insane to me. Like th obviously people were clamoring to see Dirty Harry again. Mm -hmm. But I don't. I just don't think that it's when you when you ha when you create a film like The Outlaw of Josie Wales, when you have something like The Gauntlet, two films that were critically acclaimed, and you come around and you drop 
sudden impact. Um, and just not many people received it well. Clearly, from what the critics said, it's not it's not well written. You could have gotten better writers if you wanted to reshoot. You could have done that. I don't know how the budgets would have worked back then, but we all know that Clint Eastwood is a very capable director. He's one of the best of all time. So when you drop something like that, I got to question you. But then you go and you do something like Pale Rider. It's like, all right, well, we know what Clint can do. You know, it's just it's, it's clear and obvious that one was written much better, one shot even better, one has much more thematic elements to it that pretty much carry the film as a whole to make it even better. I mean, I, I just don't see how how, how how can you defend with such sudden impact? I just don't see it, my friend. Easy. It was 1983. Clint Eastwood is still getting his footing as a director, still trying to get his own style imprinted I, I, and getting his I own did. traction and, uh, how do you say, building his own skill set. Uh, for mm -hmm. Pale Rider, uh, yeah, the Four Horsemen thing, yeah, that's how Westerns are told. They're told from, like, not, normal, not, biblical... Not, not, not every one of them. Uh, not every one of them, but for the most part, they're kind of like kung fu movies. Like you have this one fighter who comes in and saves the town or the village or whatever. Uh, like that thing. We've mm -hmm. done that a thousand times. Like, yeah, of course we don't want these people to come in and take over our quaint little towns. We like the way things are. Rich people should be held accountable for the way they are. Dirty Harry, they're painting bad guys in the light that they are just bad people. Like it's not that they're rich. It's not that they have social standings that set them apart from other people they're just bad people it's kind of like the crow like that that story for me is way more compelling like you get a chance to hate characters which i think is something important that we lose in films a lot more nowadays but then like, i believe that the, the crow is obviously could could you you could say the crow i mean as campy as it is it's clearly like a 90s grunge music video just extended for an hour and some change but at the same time you know it, it may be i would say better than sudden impact i just think that the writing it's lackluster it's not up to par it's not it's it's very choppy then you have all the scenes where people are getting killed it's almost like well I mean, is it really killing with a purpose or is this killing for fun? Because we know the 80s, yes, it's very much action packed and not so much story focused, which is why I just don't think that it, maybe you could say if the question was which one which movie's more fun, then maybe you could say sudden impact. But if we're talking about the better film between both of them, it has to go to Pale Rider, my friend. It, 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 it just has to. I disagree. This is a movie that I had never even heard of prior to this question. Like, I had to wow. Google it. And yeah, of course, Pell Rider was the first one that popped up because it's the highest rated of Clint Eastwood's movies from the 80s, but that doesn't make it the best. Like, popularity doesn't dictate value. Dirty but see, but even the favoritism is uh, what people want to see. The people have spoken, my friend. They love Clint Eastwood riding into town being deaf and bringing death to those who have wronged us. time. Good stuff. <clears throat> Alejandro, your closing minute when you begin. Reshooting a movie in 1983 is would have probably been a pain in the ass because, yes, Hollywood is something of a gatekeeping community. Like, you need when studios say that a movie is going to come out, you best believe it's going to come out unless you're DC for whatever reason. But that's not the point. Uh, Clint Eastwood <laughs> has great movies in the 70s, not so much the 80s, but for a movie to come out in 1983 and bring back a character that people were obviously clamoring for, I think makes it the best movie, especially when he helped direct the movie, when you have such an amazing character in the female lead who's not just waiting to be saved. And yeah, Pale Rider, again, good movie. I do like Westerns, but this movie has been done before and done better. Like we've done like even blazing saddles did this story better about the evil rich Baron who wants to take over the land that has to be stopped by the gunslinger. Like this is a story that's been told a thousand times. Dirty Harry in 1983, talking about uh, a woman who was assaulted and wants to take vengeance into her own hands. That makes for a more compelling story, in my opinion. And that's why I think it is the best of Clint Eastwood's movies from the 80s. Because yes, it's a small window. We still need to acknowledge sudden impact. All righty, and time there. <clears throat> And your final minute when you begin speaking, Joshua.
Sudden Impact was a launch pad for Clint to create nothing but masterpieces after the fact. Dirty Harry is a character that people enjoy. People love Dirty Harry, obviously. They clamored for him. They asked for him. Sure, sure, sure. Um, we asked for a fourth Thor film, and look how that went. I'm very much pissed off still. Granted, I like the movie more than others, and I will defend some things, but at the same time, I can acknowledge when something is not well done. And I must say, Sudden Impact just happened to suffer from that. It played too much into the action, too much into the bloodshed. And, you know, this is why you have action movies. There's nothing wrong with that. But when you want to talk about an overall story as a whole, there's only seven ways apparently throughout history to tell a story. So granted, we may hear a story several times over and over again. And sometimes you may have those who can tell that story and tell it well, while you have others who <laughs> fail at doing such things. And I just believe that when it comes down to Pale Rider and its story of hope and faith and what it's rooted in, it really gets audiences to me charged up and I think that it gives them something to look to. You know, I, I just don't believe that sudden impact had the impact in which you would think that it had suddenly. But suddenly, I would say once Pale Rider came out, it delivered the true sudden impact to those audiences that was needed. It gave them hope, gave them faith, gave them someone to look to when it's like, hey, I need someone to come to my rescue. Who can I call on? And they prayed and he was sent. Eastwood was sent by God to save these people. And Dirty Harry, well, listen, we love Dirty Harry. We, we all know what Dirty Harry stands for, but I just don't think that Dirty Harry in his own movie really liked being you know, Dirty Harry. There was just no impact. I'm sorry. Poor writing. About, that's, that's it. Just the, stop it. Stop the cut. Stop and, uh, it. <laughs> <laughs> good, good, good stuff there. Good round. Oh, excellent. This is an excellent round. Wow. Yeah. I feel like Tyson and Holyfield going at it. This is great. Right. <laughs> <laughs> We're just Keep getting the <laughs> All righty. We'll drop you guys to the back. I am not alone here. I am joined by some wonderful judges. And once my internet responds and uh, actually does the thing, come on, little button. I believe in you. I'm gonna hide myself. <laughs> Here we go. Ah, ha, 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 ha. And bleak, 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 bleak. All righty. All right. Sorry about that, guys. Obviously dealing with some internet issues on this one. We're going to try to push through them. I appreciate y'all. Um, so with that said, and concisely as you can be, who got your vote and why? Chris, I'll go to you first. All right. So this is an interesting match. Um, a lot more fat chant than actually talk about the movie a lot of times, but I went... By the slain of Marja, just because I heard a little bit more about the plot and then the detail more than in all the red red demonites and I think uh, he just brought more into the fact, I think him mentioning the pale water, the Bible references, and talking about the plot. That heard very hard all I heard was a little bit about the movie. I just heard a lot more for John. Gotcha. Zach, what you got, bud? It's also by the slimmest of margins. I also went with Josh. More because I feel like he was better able to counter um, Alejandro in terms of like, no, like it was like such a long time and nobody was really talking about uh, sudden impact because it was so under the radar and all about the writing and all that stuff. So, uh, slow as a margin, I went with Josh. All righty. With that said, we won't be needing you on this one, Nick. We'll see you next time. Thank you, judges.
All righty, good stuff there, competitors. I'm I'm just gonna be dealing with lag on the internet the whole night. I won't be hearing what you guys say, so <laughs> unfortunately, we're gonna have to deal with that. But the the competition shall move on as scheduled. We can get rid of this question here. Um, hey, oh, hey, you know what? I got great. Tato, do you want us to just drop ourselves out when it's time? I can turn the camera. Um, the camera. Yeah. yeah. Ah, there we go. See, look. Um, yeah. That might. Well, first thing I have to do is bring back this stage timer. Yeah. Sorry about this, guys. You good. All righty. Just going to go to this now. All righty. Question number two, with apologies. Um, Joshua will be going first here. Okay. Oh, geez. Would have been better with Nathan Lane in the leading role. Your minute when you begin, sir. So, when it comes down to the musicals, we're talking Nathan Lane. And, uh, yes, Nathan Lane. Brilliant actor, brilliant singer, if you will. I mean, truly, man can sing. He's got pipes, all right? I think that um, I really would have been interested in a nightmare before Christmas led Nathan Lane film. I think that his power, his ability, his acting chops, I mean, he's just phenomenal. I think it would have brought a bit more to Jack Skellington's character, in my opinion. Uh, I just think that having two people kind of go back and forth can, in a way, take away, as opposed to just having that one consistent individual um, who can know the character in and out. Granted, you could say there's probably advantages to having two different people set times and everything else, but I just think that I really would have loved to have heard Nathan Lane belt some of the music from the brilliant Nightmare Before Christmas, even though my song personally favorite is <laughs> Oogie Boogie Song. Uh, check that out on my TikTok on my rendition of it, but nevertheless, I say Nathan Lane for Nightmare Before Christmas, and I give away the rest of my time. Alrighty, I'm gonna let that tick for a second there. Tick, tick, boom. Hey, beautiful. Alrighty, Alejandro, your minute when you begin speaking, sir. First of all, yeah, absolutely. Nathan Lane is a 100% like golden entertainer who will never get the uh, recognition that he deserves because it's really hard. Like people say that it's hard to translate from TV to film, try translating from stage to film, even though that guy is arguably the most successful stage actor. Uh, for that reason, I decided to go with a musical that actually did have a stage adaptation. Uh, I wanted to see Nathan Lane replace Rick Moranis as Seymour Crowborn in Little Shop of Horrors because I think Nathan Lane has this sort of like cartoonish style to his voice uh, that makes him entertaining to watch. Uh, it would match with every other character in that movie. Plus, as a stage performer, he's got to have a deep appreciation for that character and that show as a whole. Because, man, that movie is phenomenal. I'm not saying Rick Moranis does a great job or doesn't do a great job because he absolutely does. But he's sort of like a uh, naturally awkward kind of person. Whereas Nathan Lane, I think, could bring his own comedic slapstick style to an awkwardness to Seymour Crowborn that would over -capsulate or overshadow every other performance in that film, including uh, Steve Martin as Orrin Scribello. And time. Good stuff there. Uh, so we have Nathan Lane as Jack Skellington versus Nathan Lane as Seymour Crowborn. Your two minutes when you begin speaking, Joshua. 
Chris is funny. Um, I'm very curious as to what he has to say. So um, when it comes down to it, uh, I'm not the biggest Nightmare Before Christmas fan. Oh, I know you have people out there who just they, they love the movie. I It's a good movie. I enjoy the movie. I truly do. I mean, Oogie Boogie, come on. It's like, it's phenomenal, man. It's like, come on. How can you not love the boogeyman in this? But anyway, um, I think that because of Nathan Lane's abilities to sing and act and translate his stage performances um, and take them and voice this character and breathe life into Jack Skellington, I think it would have done much better. I mean, we know Danny Elfman. Obviously, he did the singing voice. And yeah, Chris Randon, who was just his, you know, normal character voice. But I think that Nathan Lane could have being that veteran actor that he is could have brought the best of both abilities that he has and could have infused it into Jack. And it would have been interesting. I think it would have probably voted for a little more comedy, if you will, in the movie overall. Um, I know there's moments where you could say, All right, there's some funny moments here, but it's for the most part, I'd say it's pretty dark, somewhat bleak. Um, I mean, obviously the music is lively and all, and I think just Nathan Lane would have brought another element, another level of gravitas to it. I think that with what he's able to do, I think he could have brought, dove, dove into those more um, more dramatic chops and those uh, deeper emotional beats that the movie requires. And it's, he's just a talent uh, overall. So I, I really am sold on the fact that I, I really would have liked to have seen a Nathan Lane style uh, Jack Skellington. So with that being said, Alejandro, I pass it over to you, my friend. All right. Like, yep, due to lag issues, I'm just going to let the clock run. All right. I can wait. So, I feel like I should just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Nathan Lane. Running for Jack Skellington 2024. Do it. Do it. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> you too when you begin, sir. A lot of people probably don't know that Nathan Lane actually did do an anim animated musical for Disney uh, with his uh, spinoff movie for Teacher's Pet back in the early 2000s. It's really, really good. And it's a stage show in the most purest form. It's so entertaining. Uh, Nathan Lane, I think, could bring that to Little Shop of Horror specifically, because like I said, everybody in the movie seems to be doing some kind of character voice, like Steve Martin doing Orange Scrivello as this sort of like cocky 1920s biker greaser dude. Uh, Mr. Mushnick, who I that guy might actually just genuinely sound like that, but he's doing a character, obviously, and whatever the hell Ellen Green is doing in that movie, I think Nathan Lane would be able to uh, elevate those performances and make the whole thing just a cartoonish fun time. Uh, Chris Sarandon and Danny Elfman kind of bring a gravitas to Jack Skellington. Like, he's he's a very somber kind of character. He's not the comedic relief for the movie. Seymour Crowborn is comedic in his own right. Like, he his uh, relationships and the way he plays off of Audrey, Audrey to Mr. Mushnick and even Orange Gravello make him uh, like, you really care about this guy. You want him to succeed. And even though he's doing a lot of uh, random stuff, like it, the musicals based off of the movie, obviously from the uh, 1960s and that movie, or I should say Nathan Lane's performance, I think would be a much closer adaptation to that character rather than whatever Rick Moranis is doing. Cause he's just playing Rick Moranis in the movie. Nathan Lane would bring Seymour Krelborn as a character to life, uh, especially with his like natural New York accent. It would pair very well. Uh, I think if you're going to recast anybody in uh, nightmare before Christmas with Nathan Lane, it would be the, Oogie Boogie, like hit that rendition of that song, I think would be a lot more fun. But uh, all of the characters in Nightmare Before Christmas have their own sort of uh, demeanor that sells the movie. Like they're not trying to be funny. It's not trying to be a good time. It's supposed to be a uh, 
just the story that we're trying to tell. And that's how musicals work. Like Little Shop of Horrors is a horror movie in in like by definition. These plants are trying to eat people. It feeds off of blood specifically. And I think Nathan Lane, uh, like I said, has a deep appreciation as a stage actor because he did the producers before it got a movie. The same thing happened with uh, Little Shop of Horrors. And time. With that, we will move on to the four minutes when one of the competitors begins speaking. I want to clarify really quickly. Uh, the producers was on Broadway about three years before the movie came out, and that's the same thing that happened with Little Shop of Horrors. That was all I was trying to say. I, I, I do want to go to that point that you said about uh, Nathan Lane as Oogie Boogie. I just, while granted that would be interesting, I just don't see how you don't have Ken Page do it. I mean, he owns that part. He he owns it. Like, he that it. is Oogie Boogie hands down. Don't get me wrong. He absolutely kills it. But I'm thinking if you're going to replace anybody in the movie with Nathan Lane, it's going to have to be Oogie Boogie. Because like I said, Chris Sarandon and Danny Elfman bring this uh, almost like uh, distinguished character to life in Jack Skellington. But see, I think in that same right, I believe Nathan Lane also has that ability with the right direction with a director like Tim Burton, you could go and find that somber layer of an actor. I mean, that is the job of a director to find and utilize those strengths and weaknesses and to bring something out that the actor may never have known that they had. And I think that Nathan Lane could have done a brilliant job of it, honestly. I mean, but you know, Tim Burton didn't direct the movie. He just produced it. Ah, which is the problem. I hate <laughs> that. I, I know. Trust me, I get it. Like people uh, attribute that that animation style to Tim Burton, but all he did was produce the movie. All he did was like, here's a check. Fair. So, That's fine. Little Shop of Horrors. Frank Oz is a fantastic director. Like to get Yoda himself to direct Nathan Lane in a musical. Man, you best believe I am in the front row watching that movie. Well, I'll, I'll put it like this. I think that what, for me personally. Um, maybe Nightmare Before Christmas because, granted, it's kind of in a way we both chose horror movies in a way. Um, it happens just, a lot. They, There's yeah, a lot just, of horror movies that are musicals. Yeah, they just take a very fantastical musical spin to it, brings more life to it. And I think that um, as bleak as it could be, as it can be, I think that Nathan Lane would have been a solid Jack Skellington. That way you already take away from needing to have two people Play one person. Just use Nathan. Boom. Tell him what you need. I really think he can do it. With all of that theater experience, with all of his film experience, I I'm really not saying he can't do it. I'm saying it changes the tone of the film if you replace Chris Sarandon and Danny Elfman. Because then Jack Skellington becomes a cartoon character. I don't think so. It doesn't necessarily have to be that way. I, that's why I say whoever... I don't know the director's name off the top of my head. You'd probably know more than me as who the director is. But I think whoever was directing, and you have Tim Burton alongside him, you could have Nathan go in that darker, more somber route, which I think would have voted for a very um, Henry Selleck. There we go. Thank you for that, Chris. Oh, yeah. Henry um, Selleck, that's right. There we go. Okay. So I think that would have voted for something much more interesting in him overall. Uh, I feel like maybe with Little Hot Shop of Horrors, it would have been. It would have been interesting. No, not not gonna lie. I think he he pro you know, but I think um it just would have brought another layer to uh Nathan Lane's actual dynamics as an actor, if you will, if that makes sense. I, I see what you're saying, but I don't know that Nathan Lane is capable of that kind of performance. Like maybe I, I think like the quote unquote darkest or most in-depth character that he's ever played was probably in the birdcage and even then, he's doing a character like he is a cartoon in that movie. Like he is the comedic relief aspect. So I don't know that putting him as the main focus in a story that's supposed to be heartfelt. Like, what have I done? That whole thing is, for Danny Elfman specifically, is so intense and so heartfelt. It means something to him, especially for Danny Elfman, who composed the score. Come on, are you mean to tell me that you didn't tear up when he was singing? Can you feel the love tonight? He's he's losing his. <laughs> Come on, he's losing his young brother essentially. Like, oh, he's going off into love, and it just leaves me. I have nothing. They're barking up the wrong tree with that one because I'm an Elton John fan. 
I like Elton John way too much to be like, yeah, no, Nathan Lane sells that movie. And you see, that's the yeah, thing. No, like, yeah, even right. in The Lion King, he's the comedic relief. He's not trying to be uh, an intense or deep character. That just happened to be Elton John adding music to a voice. And you know what? I will give Nathan Lane credit as a voice because he is a fantastic yeah, singer. Exactly. As yeah. a character actor, I'm not... I'm a little hit and miss with him, but like as far as in depth, I don't know that he can give that kind of performance. He's more of a comedic style, which I think is why a little shop of horrors fits him better. Wow. There it is. There it is. (laughs) (laughs) And time on that one. Very good stuff there, guys. Uh, very minor thing there, but I will ask all judges to refrain from posting anything about the debate in the chat, please. Um, all right. Good stuff. With that said, we will move on to your final minute, Josh. Should I say something? Because the timer didn't start. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> it's like when your scene partner's supposed to give you a line and they don't. It's like, what do I do? It's so weird, you know. Oh, boom! There's the timer. Okay, so, uh yeah, man. I, I, like I said, I think that as an actor, um, being able to explore different veins and avenues of, you know, different roles can help add to your toolbox, your toolkit um, as an actor overall. And I just think that, you know, even though it works for Nathan Lane, he's funny. He sings very well. He plays very loud characters very, very well. Um, and he's very entertaining and he's very good at it. I just would have liked to have seen if, you know, if he decided to take a different turn, a different approach and, you know, go into something that he probably wouldn't normally do. Obviously, it's still a musical, uh, and it will be more horror-related and be a much darker tone, but I'd be very, very curious to see what Nathan Lane could do alongside the likes of Henry Selleck and Tim Burton and what he could have brought to Jack Skellington. And imagine this, Nathan Lane versus Ken Page. It'd be a very, very interesting scene to me. I'm just saying, if it's done right... I just think it'd be very, very well done. Um, the resident musician may disagree with me, but it's okay. He's a musician. <laughs> but I, with that, I can see the rest of my time. Go for it. Yeah. Nathan Lane, 2024. <laughs> for Jack Skellington. All righty. Your minute when you begin speaking, Alejandro. Like I said, horror and musicals go together like peanut butter and jelly. You look at Sweeney Todd. You look like you look at the Hunchback of Notre Dame, Phantom of the Opera, freaking Heather's, goddamn Evil Dead got a musical. So yeah, horror movies have uh, that ability to cross over. Um, a Little Shop of Horrors. Even though it is marketed as a horror movie, even the original 1960s movie isn't necessarily a horror movie. That's why I think Nathan Lane would bring. Uh, out Seymour Crowborn a lot more. It's and having him face off against Ken Page, man, you talk about two voices that do not blend together. Just as a guy who, yeah, resident musician. Sorry, I have to say that. Like uh, having Danny Elfman in that spot specifically gives that movie uh, the benefit of being able to adjust as necessary. Uh, Frank Oz would bring out Nathan Lane in his most intense and purest form, in my opinion. Nathan Lane. It does best with characters and stories that are comedic. And uh, while, like you were saying, Nightmare Before Christmas does have comedic moments, it's not overall a comedy, and it's not even something that uh, I think is necessarily a family film. Like it, 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 it's about these people who are hijacking a different holiday. And I think Chris Sarandon, like I say, brings uh, this sort of distinguished quality to Jack Skellington. Like he pairs around, like he's supposed to be this very suave, very debonair character. And uh, where Seymour Crowborn is just kind of this uh, awkward guy who's trying to uh, justify his reasons for why it's okay to kill people. And time. Alrighty, with that said, we will remove the competitors.
Bring in the judges. Good stuff, guys. Good stuff. Hmm. And boopy doopy doop. All right, we got the judges in on this one, Zach. Sorry, I can't see your face, but again, for lag <laughs> issues, gonna refrain from clicking. Um, Zach, we will go to you first, though. Who you got on this one? I got Alejandro, and more because he brought up three interesting points. Uh, he would make the uh movie like more animated. He would definitely be able to bring. Uh, the character in Little Shop of Horrors more to life and about how Nathan Lane would kind of elevate the other characters in the movie. And for those reasons, I went with Alejandro. All righty. And Nicholas, who do you got? I also went with Alejandro. I think that uh, he just had like a lot of really good takedowns for why Nathan Lane wouldn't fit uh, well for... Uh, Nightmare Before Christmas, as far as I really liked his point about like Danny Elfman being the guy that wrote the music. Of course, he would know how to, he would know the emotions behind actually singing it. And uh, I liked his point about uh, Frank Oz being able to bring out the best in uh, him. So for uh, Little Chef of Horror, so that's why I went with that one. All righty, Chris, I know you got a ton of thoughts on this one. You're going to have to bottle them for now. We'll talk about it later. Thank you very <laughs> much, judges. We will go on. <laughs> Sorry, Diaz. All righty, good, good stuff here. We got it one-to-one here. Um, I'm in the movie battleground uh, match. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> it's good stuff. Um, we do have a one-to-one -one match here. Again, apologies to Aaron. He's not going to have a great time with this one. Um, and apologies to everyone watching at home. But I'm doing the best I can with what I got. Um, with that right. said, We'll, we will move on to the third question. Back over to Alejandro first. This question. What is the worst of the original six Saw sequels? Alejandro, your minute when you begin speaking, sir. Uh, Man, talk about two back-to-back -back rounds that I have a lot of specific opinions on. Uh, I think this question needs to go through a rewrite because I misunderstood the assignment. Like, we all know that Saw 3D is the worst of the Saw movies, at least in the original saga. Um, the movie that I went with that I think missed the entire point of the franchise in the first place would have to be Saw 4. Uh, this movie like I said, missed the entire point of the first three movies. This is the first movie that Jigsaw is not actually in. Uh, he, We go off on a different character that has nothing to do with what we've been focusing on, and then it also has the uh, the most annoying death in history with uh, Donnie Wahlberg playing Detective Matthews. Like, you're telling me we waited two movies just to see this guy die randomly for no reason? That's absolutely annoying. Uh, and that on top of the fact that this movie is so poorly put together. Like, the first three Saw movies, like, barring whatever problems the third movie has, and I really like the second movie, I don't even care, but the, the fourth movie has no tone whatsoever. The pacing is all over the place, and the characters are just unlikable. Uh, that's why, ultimately, I decided to go with the fourth installment of Saw. This movie had a drop-off that we still haven't recovered from, let's be honest. And time. Joshua, your one minute opening when you speak, sir. To anyone out there who was a uh, who watched SpongeBob a lot growing up, what's better than 24? 25. <laughs> but in this case, what's worse than four? Five. <laughs> It's so bad, and it's unnecessary. The acting, 
is garbage. The fact that we even got five movies out of a franchise that probably should have died at three with its main draw, its main character, Jigsaw himself, played by Tobin Bell. Maybe it should have just ended right there and we wouldn't have the amount of torture porn that we have now in today's society. But I say to you right now, Saw 5 is the worst. Why? Because it was a catalyst for making six seven, 3D, eight, nine, and 10. Like it's a jigsaw, all of this. I'm, I'm tired of it, I'm done, I'm finished. I'm fed the f up, I cannot take it anymore. Why do we continue to just milk this property? Something that started off uh, brilliant, different psychologically, and then it just spiraled into this thing of, hey, let's just watch people die in ridiculous traps. Then let's just continue it and keep it going. And then throw in flashbacks that make no sense. Why? The effects, trash acting garbage i can't stand saw five and i hope that the rest of you at home watching understand my rage for this head time we got a good one here uh <laughs> excuse me alejandro your two minutes when you begin speaking sir First of all, spiraled. I see what you did there. Um, Saw 5 at least had the decency to try to pick up where Saw 3 left off, whereas Saw 4 has absolutely nothing to do with Jigsaw. Like, yeah, we still got the traps. Yeah, we're still trying to teach a lesson. Ultimately, doesn't matter. Like, the whole thing with, uh, and yeah, we do uh, introduce uh, Detective Hoffman, I think that was his name, the dude who's supposed to be the su successor to Jigsaw, but it comes so far out of left field, it's not even clever. Like, yes, it's a twist, but it it's so far out of left field. Like, who cares even at this point? Uh, Saw 4 tried so hard to make you... Uh, feel that sort of justification the same thing i was saying in the last round that justification of why it's okay that this guy's getting punished whereas in saws one through three you at least got that feeling you understand why the, the uh, first two characters had to be in that room you understand why all of these people had to be in the house in the second movie you understand why this dude had to specifically be the one who walked through this house while his wife operated on jigsaw saw four has absolutely nothing to do with that we try to go into this crime drama aspect of the story that doesn't matter at all that's not why we're here yes we want to see people cut their arms off like that's the draw of the movie is to have the the practical effects that sell the movie that's the one thing i will say about the saw franchise that even though they do keep milking the property for no reason they at least have the decency to keep using practical effects and not move into cg uh, Saw 5, like I say, has the decency to try to pick up the story and explain where Jigsaw came from. And yeah, that's kind of what you have to do at this point in the series. Like, look at uh, uh, Friday the 13th. Look at Nightmare on Elm Street. This is, the, this is something that horror movies do regularly. Saw 4, on the other hand, just is wasted time. You walk away with nothing from this movie. The movie is so bland. Like, it, it doesn't... Uh, Sorry, I'm going to calm down. I'm going to calm down because this movie actually does piss me off. Uh, the movie, I think, is the worst of the original six Saw sequels, uh, barring, of course, Saw 3D, which we all know is the worst of them. That movie has the same exact tone as Saw 4. I don't know how this movie can even be considered a Saw movie. You might as well make it a Hannibal movie. And time. Your two-minute response when you begin, sir. Alejandro, do you like seeing me angry? Do you like seeing me upset? Do you like seeing me take things that shouldn't be personal? So personal. Saw 5 at this point has become extremely personal. Granted, it tried to at least tell somewhat of a story. But it's mostly flashbacks, bad effects. At least with four, you can at least stand the actors in a way. Five, it's just, no, there's nothing wholesome. The fact that we got four and it led us to five, I don't really think that that is really necessarily what makes it worse. You just see the drop in quality. Even on Rotten Tomatoes, saw four, 18%. Saw five, 13 Everyone is of the collective consensus that we agree that these films have become nothing more than endless 
torture porn for weirdos to incessantly jack off to. I'm not a fan of that whatsoever. Okay. Are the traps any better? I don't know. Do you feel like they are? I don't think so. At this point, exactly like I said, I just think they should have stopped at three. But no, they went ahead and made four. And which what, what was the catalyst for that? People wanted five. Here we go with five. It's just absolutely worse for some strange reason. I'll never understand. The, the consistencies are so inconsistent and it makes no sense in the inconsistency of the consistency for there to be consistencies within the inconsistencies. Make that make sense to me. This movie should have ended. Should have stopped. Should have never been made at all. Grant, I understand your point about, you know, that at least they're trying to explore the backstory of Jigsaw. I got that. I got that. But at the same time, why not just make it some sort of prequel, I guess, if you will. Or, you know what? Better yet, just again, just don't make it just don't make it at all. Just don't make it at all. They're literally all the same movie. It's just what do you do slightly differently to make it better? And five didn't really do anything except just tell us flashbacks from shit that we've seen before. So you're pretty much yeah. Oh, and uh, all righty, we got some good anger flowing. I, let let the hate flow through you guys, and uh, let the hate flow whenever one of you begins speaking. I want to clarify my very last point and what I was trying to say. Sorry, I'm. Filled with so much rage, not even Raphael could face me in battle. I understand this. Understand this. Well, all I'm saying is, at the end of the day, we all know that with Saw 5, you're pretty much rehashing all the other movies, just trying to put them in one, but you're telling them through flashbacks and really jarring effects. And it doesn't really bode for showing something different. It's really nothing different other than the quote unquote traps themselves, which after a while becomes like, is this, I mean, granted, yes, it's creative with what they're able to do with certain traps, but we see the same things all the time. It's just people dying from getting stuck in these traps that they can't seem to figure out. And that's it. That's you want to talk about the traps? Detective Matthews get his head smashed with two blocks of ice. Why? Because that's why. There, there's no cleverness behind it at all. Even there's, though Donnie Wahlberg no brings anything. that character to life in such an amazing way. Like, I don't think Donnie Wahlberg is the best actor, but God damn it if Detective Matthews isn't the best character in the Saw franchise, aside from Tobin Bell, of course, playing Jigsaw. But, and you you say, oh, it should have been a prequel. It was a prequel. Like, that's the whole point of the story is to tell this, uh, show the evolution of the character of Jigsaw come, going from John Kramer to Jigsaw, the serial killer. But was it a compelling evolution? Was it evolution with a reason? Did it make you feel? Did it actually give you something to be like, you know what? I feel for this character. I should go out and just start setting traps for everybody in the goddamn neighborhood who pisses me off. Who After does me wrong? Four, I didn't no. feel anything for this franchise. You can't feel anything for it. I'm literally sitting here on a machine. I'm on a rack myself watching these films being twisted, tortured, discontorted, bones broken, blood spilling everywhere for no singular reason. I will not understand why this franchise continues. Who watches Saw anymore? God damn it. I, I kind of do, but that's besides the point. I saw Chris I saw Chris Ramsey was going to be in Spiral and I was like, I got to see that nonsense. Okay, first of all. I don't think it. Saw is necessarily torture porn for the sake of torture porn the same way goddamn Hostel is, but Saw, it, like it, <laughs> like you said, it started off with such a compelling and interesting idea. Like you want to care about Jigsaw so much, but when it time when it comes time to actually tell a story, like after he dies, we're supposed to go into something more compelling than oh, let's let's torture this cop for two and a half hours or whatever the runtime of the movie is. But, but, they, but you kill exactly like you kill. Kill your character in the third, the one that everyone's supposed to be like, we love this guy. And then you want to continue and continue. And yet each one is progressively worse. The effects are worse. The filters hurt my eyes. Do you not see the damage that has been done to me from these films? I have scars, okay? You just can't see them. They're lesions on my corneas. I can't do it anymore, Alejandro. 
No, that's not happening. I'm sorry. At, no. at least, like I said, at least Saw 5 has a story that you can follow. It's Even though if it's not the best story. story, you can at least follow it. Saw 4 it's doesn't give you anything to work with. All it does is show you, hey, let, let's show. <laughs> we got to make sure this guy knows not to enter open doors. What kind of garbage is that? Well, you tell me. So why do critics seem to love 4? What? Slightly more, five percent <laughs> more, exactly five percent more than five. I don't probably know, because there's literally it just doesn't work. Eighteen. Probably because what you said in the first round that Rotten Tomatoes isn't the most reliable source for rating. They aren't, but we did not know this until within recent weeks, and now here we are sitting talking about what's the worst of the original six Saw films, and it's clearly this is the it's worst. It's absolutely uh, soft work. I'm soft sorry. Is, the, is on life support. Like, yes, you killed off Jigsaw in the third movie. That doesn't have to kill the momentum of the entire franchise, then, especially if you're going to do a fourth movie. Then help me out here. Then if you want to create a fifth movie, why is the entire basis of your movie consistent flashbacks to things we have seen before at that point it becomes lazy what you tried to do in four was at least effort by introducing a new character there was at least an effort in that point that's just well, lazy it writing. would have been effort if he lived but he died if my and point time, it's and time. Time. Oh my good stuff there is everybody good <laughs> and pissed off let's write a rock song uh, <laughs> all right let's do something in d minor i'm kidding i'm not gonna do that later we got one more minute of this debate from each player to get to alejandro you are on your minute when you begin speaking sir yes saw five is a collection of flashbacks that ultimately tell the story of how jigsaw got created saw four is a puzzle that was not solved that results in a death of a character that you care absolutely nothing about and then introduces another character who's supposed to be your new main villain for the franchise and oh god and uh, like i said the whole detective matthews things pisses me off beyond recognition and yeah the traps they're not even clever in Saw 4. At least in Saw 5, you have the whole thing with the knives in front of the face for the guy who killed his child. You have uh, the glass box introduction that we're going to use eventually later on, but that doesn't matter right now. And I'm not saying Saw 5 is a good movie by any stretch of the imagination, but is it better than Saw 4? Absolutely. Saw 4 is such a pain in my rectum. Like, for real. This movie wasted so much of my life, and I can't believe I actually had to rewatch it again just for this. Uh, this Saw 4 could have been something incredibly great. Like I said, why did it have to kill the momentum of the entire franchise from this movie? Like, this is the dropping point. This is the point where people stopped giving a shit. This is the point where even the producers stopped giving a shit. This, this movie could absolutely not exist, and 100% nothing would change. If we turned Saw 5 into Saw 4, it at least would have told a cohesive story. You go from Jigsaw's death to Jigsaw's creation. Saw 4... Absolutely nothing gained from this movie. I hate it so much. Time. And the final minute of this one, when you begin speaking, Joshua. You like this, don't you? You're like pissing me off. That's what it is. That's what it is. You just, you really get a kick out of this, don't you? Like cayenne pepper. You just want to see me just uh, hear me out when I say this. There were people who actually found four somewhat entertaining. And I think it was with what four was doing and trying to be different by having a new character, which I can appreciate. All right, fine. You want to do something different? Go ahead. Explore that in the creativity. But what I don't like is when you decide to do another one and then all you do is show footage from before. See, that at that point, that's just lazy writing. It should have never been done. It should have never been made at that point. If you're going to do something, do it with intent. There was no intent behind it. They're just like, hey, you know what? We think the audience is dumb, so let's just put in all these other images of past things. We'll throw in Hoffman, we'll throw in Strom, and let's play a game of cat and mouse and see what takes place. Oh, by the way, let's add these little flashbacks in between to this Pepper and tell the story, and maybe he can figure all this out, and maybe the audience will just follow along, and they'll enjoy it because, ha, more traps, more blood, more death. 
More gore. No, none of that. I'm sorry. If you feel as though that I'm being highly aggressive with you, it's not you. It's the movie. And it pisses me off to no end, to the nth degree. It's just because it's lazy. I'd rather you be creative and try something than be lazy as hell with it. That's it. That's my point for it. And time. All right. Once again, a great... And I love cayenne pepper. Yeah, it's, it's like my favorite lot. pepper. It's a great, it's a great basis for seasonings. Trust and believe. All right, good stuff there, guys. We will bring back in the judges, and we will start off here with Nick, Chris, Zach. You kill me here. <laughs> Hey, we are all in. Thank you, judges. That was a great one. Good luck to you. Um, I will go to you first, Nicholas. So this was fun. Um, I've never seen like two guys go get get. I've never seen another person get to all hundred level before. So this is a, this is a fun time for me. By the slimmest of margins, I gave it to Josh mostly because I I. I think his main sticking point of like why even make another movie if all you're going to do is one Um And I don't like while I while I think that Alejandro's point about it this about Saw Four being the drop off point, I just couldn't get past the Saw Five is just flashbacks thing. I don't know if that was ever taken down in the argument. So Joshua, mm. all righty, Chris, what do you got, bud? Uh, this was an interesting match. Um, take out my opinion, uh, take out my love for this franchise, some stuff for Manchester Man. I, by the slender of margin, and I will say Top is actually good one of my after five. Um, I went with Josh. I think his anger toward the Saw franchise for what is without doubt the worst because of it, He just brought so much for uh, the flashback, the, the torture upon torture. The cat mouth that made no sense at all. Yeah, Josh. <laughs> all righty. We won't need you on this one, Zach. And with that, Josh moves up 2-2-1 two, two, in this match. Good, good stuff there, guys. <laughs> can I can I just go wash my hands real quick? The level of Absolutely. Right. I'm going to shower after that. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff, guys. Good stuff. Oh, yeah. That was fun. Everybody wants to get hold of me all of a sudden. God damn. I've returned. Welcome back. Alrighty. Thank you. All right. Moving on to question number four. We are back on Josh going first. Question number four. We got a broad one here. Very simply, what is the best film directed by Steven Spielberg? Your minute when you begin speaking, sir. Uh, yeah, man. Um, Steven Spielberg, the greatest director of all time. <laughs> All time, my personal favorite director has created a plethora of films that shan't be forgotten for as long as time stands and runs and continues. I think that um, me personally, I have to go with what is Steven Spielberg's best work. I truly believe the original Jurassic Park is peak Spielberg. Um, the story overall is just incredible. It is one of my favorite films of all time. 
what Spielberg was able to do by bringing these dinosaurs to life and tell it in such a way where it blends the suspense and the horror with also the curiosity, the imagination, and told in the basis of science and blending that fiction just perfectly. Uh, it, it really is at its core, in a way, a family film, <laughs> in a way, um, but it is definitely told in the best way possible by blending those horror elements, seeing what it means for families to stick together and how we should, there are certain things we should refrain from doing and things that, you know, it's like, <laughs> do you really think we should go and dig up bones and bring back these dinosaurs and let people just go on ahead and tour on the island and watch them and then boom, 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 there's eaten by T-Rexes and Velociraptors all over the place. No, 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 no. It's a terrible idea. But I will say at the end of the day, Jurassic Park is Steven Spielberg's best work to date. Time conceded as it continues to run. Stop Indeed. Hey, that's how the clock goes sometimes. You're a minute when you begin to speaking Alejandro. The accolades of Steven Spielberg cannot be questioned, even though uh, I don't think personally he's the best director ever. I have a at least three other directors that I would consider the best of, of all time before Steven Spielberg. Like, even though I really love his movies, such as The Terminal, Saving Private Ryan, I had to go with a movie that not only was a nightmare to make, but also a pseudo sequel to a story that nobody asked for. Once again, uh, I decided to go with the ever popular classic tale of Hook. Uh, this movie is still regarded today as one of the best movies ever made. And it absolutely deserves it because not only do you have uh, outstanding performances across the board with huge names robin williams dustin hoffman uh, uh julia no not julia roberts yes julia roberts the other one and uh, all of these uh children as well you also have classic style storytelling with a sound stage with this uh and like i say it is a pseudo sequel because peter pan doesn't need a sequel but even though it had been made People were were just absolutely awestruck by this movie when they saw it for the first time. And Robin Williams brings, uh, or I should say, Steven Spielberg brings Robin Williams' character of Peter Pan to life in a way that nobody had ever seen before and in all likelihood will never see again. So that's why I ultimately went with Hook. All right, and time. Joshua, you're two minutes when you begin speaking. Here's the thing about Hook. Um, Hook is more of a, I would say, a cult classic. Formed a very late following. Um, critics weren't necessarily a fan of it. Um, audiences seem to have liked it a little bit more, but not by much. Um, the thing is, though, when it comes down to it, Steven Spielberg was able to take a book written by Michael Crichton that is probably considered one of the most terrifying novels ever written. Uh, it's also very well written due to the basis of science and genetics and biology and chemistry that lie within it and how these dinosaurs were made and constructed in these labs and the history of it all. Um, the thing is what Spielberg, the brilliance of what Spielberg was able to do was not only, like I said, he blended suspense and he blended wonder perfectly. In the mind of a child, when you think about it, dinosaurs are the greatest things to have ever walked the earth. But then when you see them in real life and realize that there are a lot of giant predators and even herbivores that are coming to get that, that will fiercely defend their young, um, it gets really, really terrifying. And he still made it terrifying in many, many ways. I remember being horrified by the scene with uh, Muldoon as he's, you know, lining a ride up, has that rifle sitting right there, that spaz rifle, spaz shotgun, excuse me. And all of a sudden, the big one just comes in. Clever girl. 
attacks him. You just hear the screams, the visceralness of it all. You, all you hear is this man just being ripped to shreds, and he's able to convey these images in your eyes without not even having to show every single thing, but you get the gist of the horror that there is. And he's able to make you question within the story. Is there some things that we just should not test? How far is too far? Why do we push science in these ways in which we probably should not? Is it really good for mankind to continue about the way in which we go? It talks about so many things. It's such a layered movie, such a great product, and what it was able to do for the 90s and for many, many, many movies that come out in the future. For example, the Michael Bay Transformers movies, the MCU, a lot of future... um. Superhero films, when it comes to those special effects and having that Stan Winston company to be able to bring such realism to these dinosaurs that he was able to partner up with and bring them to life. No one ever thought that this was something that could happen, and yet he did it, and it changed the game 65 million years in the making. That's the tagline. Boom. And time. Your two minutes when you begin speaking, Alejandro. Well, since you brought it up, uh, the adaptation of the book is actually drastically different than the book itself. Uh, and yet, animals are horrifying. Like, that's just the whole point. Don't mess with animals. That's the first thing. Don't don't ever screw with any animal, no matter what. Like, even a squirrel will jack you up. No problem. Uh, and for Jurassic Park, you, you talk about, like, the, uh, the fundamental question of should we do it versus can we do it? That is... As a family film for a child, that is so incredibly boring. People don't remember the first hour of the movie until the dinosaurs actually come in. Like, that's the biggest selling point of the movie are the special effects. And you want to talk about the horror in Jurassic Park? Let's talk about the kidnapping sequence in Hook at the beginning of the movie. Like, th that scene is so out of place for any other movie except for that one because it is almost a comic book movie. It gets to be everything. It gets to be an action a comedy a horror and a love story this whole thing it, it blends together so well and for a director to bring in huge personalities like robin williams dustin hoffman goddamn bob hoskins and julia roberts who famously didn't want to play well with anybody and still produce one of the best movies of all time that is the mark of a good director and that's ultimately why i chose hook as steven spielberg's best directed movie because th even though uh, it is a challenge to wrangle all these children. Like you've probably done kids shows in the past. You know how chaotic it can get to have all of these kids on a soundstage throwing food at each other. I can't even imagine what a uh, nightmare that must have been. Uh, Hook, I think, will be a, a classic tale that people re will revisit time and time again. Jurassic Park has the disadvantage of having been tied to the Jurassic World movies. Uh, while I do like Jurassic Park, I do think the second movie is just a little bit better. It tells the story a lot smoother. It gets to the point, the meat of the story immediately. And Jurassic Park is something of a, it's a thinker, right? Like you have to actually pay attention to what's going on. Hook, Yes, you already know this story. Yeah, you already know these characters. We want to see what happened immediately after. And that's why I call it a pseudo sequel, because this is not something that people were were obviously rioting for to have to have Peter Pan come in. Oh, he has a family now. What happens if he goes back to Neverland? Why? Do, how, what if Captain Hook comes in and steals his child? We have the uh, story or we have the same setting, we have even the dog stay. And this movie, I think, is uh, one of the most heartfelt and, and challenging stories to tell because Robin Williams, back to the Nathan Lane argument, is one of those guys who can be funny and heartfelt at the same time. His uh, performance alone, the, or rather the performance that Steven Spielberg brings out of him, makes it the better movie, in my opinion. And time. Boy, oh, boy, oh. All righty, we got another four minutes on our hands, and it will begin whenever a competitor begins speaking. Alejandro, it's clear that you like to fight, and granted, I am a brawler, so I'm going to bring in everything I have. First off, you're incorrect. First hour of the movie, the dinosaurs did not show up. Actually, it was in the first, right. uh, within five minutes of the movie, you actually see the Velociraptor attack uh, 
Joff Jeffrey. Wow. Yeah, you know. yeah, yes, you do. You yeah, see, yeah. It's, quick. it's quick. You see the eye. You know what it is. You see the eye. You don't see it in its full entirety, but you see it. So you know automatically. And I get it. We don't want to give up the ghost too soon. Sure. Oh, but of it's course. still boring. It's like, not especially when it when brings you in because you're wondering what is that? What just attacked him? What could that be? And you then know you what it is. Over. Yeah, you we, saw we, on we the don't know specifically what it is. Park. It's you about know, dinosaurs. You don't know specifically what it is, though. But that's the thing. He, what he was able to do from the novel and take, even though the uh, obviously the film is different, and Michael Crichton helped create the screenplay and make it different from the novel, so it wasn't too heavy for children. He made it in a way where it only it, it was able to capture their fascination by adding the characters of Tim and his sister Alex into it so you could understand what it was like from the mind of a child studying someone who you've known for all these well you didn't know he didn't know uh Dr. Grant personally, but he read his book and how curious he was about everything that was going on and the character development of Grant into actually wanting to be a father figure for Tim because in the beginning of the movie, he didn't even want kids when he and Ellie were together. And it's touched upon later on in the franchise, which we are not going to talk about. But that's the point. Like, why turn this story into a family-friendly story at all? Like, this is this could have been easily one of the best R-rated horror movies of all time. because It Grant could have Park been. When you have somebody getting eaten alive by a velociraptor, you want to see that. Like, you don't want to just hear gunshots and just a zoom in. You on this think about it. If you're making a movie for dinosaurs, you know kids are going to want to be involved. Think about the land before they time. See the think about how dark the land before time was and how well it still did. Come on. Really? <laughs> Alejandro, you are, you are making me great. Listen, hear me out. Hear me out. Yeah. He also was able to cultivate one of the greatest performances from Jeff Goldblum create an iconic character from Dr. Ian Malcolm. Yes, that's true. Away, outside of the fly. Ah, but it is true, my friend. And no, then he gets Jeff all the way one of those afterwards. actors, even outside the fly, in Invasion of the Body Snatchers, he gives a bomb performance. But I'm saying Dr. Ian Malcolm was a scene stealer throughout. There is not a single performance in the movie that was lacking. Bob Peck was great. Sam Neill was great. Lord Dern was great. Jeff Goldblum was great. Samuel L. Jackson was great. Even though he was not in there very, very long, he saw serviced very, very well. You had Richard Attenborough, who was the great macho Dr. John Hammond, building this park who you were drawn to because of his charisma. And he was able to bring that out. And it's just... <laughs> Which is a credit to the actors and not necessarily the director. Like, yes, Bob Hoskins and Dustin Hoffman as Hook and Shmi have had agreed be backstage that uh, Captain Hook and Shmi had this sort of almost homoerotic relationship, but they were trying to not play off of it. That is the uh, underlying tone of their performances. And that doesn't come across at all, even for a kid's movie that is specifically made for children. You didn't have to change anything about this movie to make it family friendly. It's still a flaw in the argument of what you said though because you said what he was what Spielberg was able to bring out from Williams and from Hoffman so it right. still applies to mine what he was able to bring out with Sam Neill with Laura Dern and everybody else that's involved in the cast he was able to bring and the movie is paced perfectly like it does not miss a beat it constantly moves there's no lulls there's no and whenever there is a slow moment it's a very heartfelt moment for example when it's meant to draw that's all it is, is that you're, you're drawing out the suspense of the horror that's no longer there because you made it family friendly. But you have the wonderment of it all. Think about it. If you see a Brachiosaurus outside, uh -huh. would you cower in fear or would you be like, you know what? I mean, you but you would. Let me, let me refer Megalophobia you is would, a real thing. And would, I have it. I got you. So you would have a blend of legitimately both feelings, which is what he was able to convey, that wonderment and that fear, that awe and that shock and horror of it all. In the beginning, when they first pull up and they see the Brachiosaurus standing up and it's eating from the tree, they are literally, clearly in wonderment. When they finally get to see the T-Rex and the T-Rex is broken out, that's when the fear really, truly starts to set in when the, when the right. entire base is just starting to fall You apart. can be in awe that's and not be in horror. horror. That's the whole thing about the Triceratops in the movie is that Oh, it's it's majestic. But it see how he paces it. The majesty in it. But it doesn't set the horror tone that the book does. Like, that's the whole point. That's why the but, adaptation but that's that's why why hates the adaptation of the movie in the first place. Even though but, the book hey. doesn't have an adaptation, it's a follow-up to a story that we know that everybody knows, that everybody's known for years, that nobody wanted. Alejandro, my friend. <laughs> Damn you. <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, yeah, good, good stuff there. 
Um, holy be Jesus. <laughs> Great yeah. stuff, you guys. That's all I can say. Am I um, able to go with my closing argument here? Yes. <laughs> it go seems right to be again. Okay. So th- for, for a movie that I don't see how you don't people don't love this. It's it's not like it was the <laughs> it's not like it nearly made a billion dollars, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> 978 million is nothing to sneer at, my friend. But hear me out when I say this. Obviously, yes, the dinosaurs are the draw, but you also you can't just have dinosaurs and then not tell a great story. That's what the gist of it was. Obviously, Michael Bay failed at that by just thinking. We just want to see Transformers, and we just want to see great CGI, and that is it. And yet, you failed. You didn't really tell a great story overall, but what Spielberg was able to do, being the gifted storyteller that he is, and also working with Michael Crichton, yes, the book was obviously different, but he had to tailor it differently because he knew that there were going to be kids watching this, and he didn't want to make it too scary where they shied away from it, yes, but just scary enough to be like, all right, (laughs) it makes you question some things, because that's the whole gist of it all. Should we evolve to a point where we just don't seem to have any self-control, or should we have some sort of control on the things that we are able to control? Some things just are out of our hands, and God is able to do the rest of it, but you have to understand this. The movie itself is brilliant. It's a masterpiece in every way, shape, and form, and I just don't see how you could say that Hook is superior to this when it clearly and evidently is not in any way. And time. Alrighty. <sighs> Your final minute when you begin speaking, Alejandro. This is the most fun I've ever had. All right. Spielberg blending styles is one of the things that I think he does really well. Like his ability to uh, mesh that family friendly style with horror elements is what sets him apart from most directors. Take a look at E.T., which I think is a movie that does the horror aspect with the family aspect way better than Jurassic Park does. Because unfortunately, you do still have to have that fundamental question versus can we or should we? And that is so uh, uninteresting for a child who only wants to see dinosaurs. Like, that's the reason we watch the movie is to see the dinosaurs. We don't want to spend however long talking about how birds are reptiles. And yes, they absolutely are. But that's besides the point. Hook was so just so hard to do from the beginning. Like, you, you start off with a story uh, that nobody wanted to know a, a, the a, a follow-up to. Because there's no follow-up to this uh, story, but Steven Spielberg brought this character and these uh, uh, these stories to a more modern light and brought them to life in a way that people are going to be talking about for years. Robin Williams and Dustin Hoffman give outstanding performances. Julia Roberts, even though she was a gigantic pain in the ass for Steven Spielberg, she still even manages to get a good performance, even though people don't really care about Tinkerbell as much as they do Peter Pan. But that's not why we're watching the movie. We want to tell. We want to hear the story. Not see the spectacle. And time. All right. Good, good stuff there. We will drop the competitors. Uh, Wow. Just fantastic. That was phenomenal. Judges, back to that original rotation. You guys like to trust me with these questions. (laughs) All righty. And sorry, I can't see you guys just yet. All right. Now I can see you guys. And we'll also do this. Um, Chris, what do you have? (laughs) So, just an interesting question. Um, Interesting timing on this. We mentioned after the match. Why? But um, I went by the slide of modern. Both of these movies are great. Both great. But I thought Josh Joshua brought the argument home of like the one minute, what the moment us beautiful and managed to counterpoint everything out of Honda did. I didn't hear much about her other than the performances and then what was specific about the opening. I just brought everything into this argument for me. Great, great debate overall. Gotcha, gotcha. Zach, what you got, bud? 
uh, I also went with Josh more because uh, he he was able to talk about how it was a great blend of suspense horror, and curiosity and how it was a, a good adaptation of a terrifying book with even Michael Crichton coming in as screenwriter to, uh, to make it a more family-friendly movie. And I didn't hear much about Hope. So for that, I went with Josh. All righty. Thank you very much, judges. I'm going to send you all to the back here. Um, and we will because. And your winner with a score of three, two, one, Joshua Diggins. Victory is mine. I've come to claim it. From the mountains of Asgard, I have returned victorious, the son of Odin, with a victory over Alejandro on this day. I feel fantastic, energized. The thunder and lightning is shooting through my veins as we speak. And Tato, your judgment in this match and all the other judges there, you have earned a place in Valhalla. Understand this. From this day forward, you're in my army. Great, great stuff. Fantastic match all around, I got to say. Um, that would be the end of your season, but you're ending it. That will likely be the end of your season, I should say. You never know what could happen. Um, but you're at two and two. How are you feeling about the future? I feel good. With each match, I just feel, I genuinely feel like um, getting better. Uh, I didn't feel like I, you know, in the last loss that I had, I didn't feel like I lost hope. Um, I just felt like I was hungry and ready for the next match and the exhibition match definitely gave me a lot of confidence. I mean, taking on Austin and um, Jonathan at the same time. So it was it was great going into a triple threat match and then having to really stand alone in that. Now going into this um, and coming out of that victorious and then coming into this uh, well, and leaving this with a victory, um, I felt pretty good. There was a point in time I kind of felt I definitely felt some sort of shift <laughs> when um Alejandro won the second round but but I didn't feel it enough to be like all right don't worry about it I just let it roll kept on going and um the saw arguments uh I'm just like look, I'm just gonna give you everything that I have and then the last question I was really waiting for because I was just I'm not holding back but um it just happened to be saw that just pissed me off more and I just took that same energy went into the last one and yeah man nah it feels good and Alejandro was a great great opponent man it was fun it was awesome um just I, I love this match this game is great and uh I can't wait to see what the future has in store for myself in this uh movie battleground world fantastic thank you very much we will go to the unfortunate second place finisher in this one Alejandro, also probably your final uh, technical match of the season. We, but you got exhibitions on the stack. How are you feeling about the future, sir? Oh, I'm looking forward to those exhibitions quite a bit. This was uh, one of the most fun matches I've ever had, if not my most fun match. I, I loved pissing Josh off. That was the that was the most fun thing about this match. <laughs> like, yes, I have very specific opinions about movies. Go figure. Oh, but to quote Josh. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end to them. Ah, but yeah, this won't be my last match at all. Uh, not even for, uh, not just for this year, but also next season. I'll be back stronger than ever. Awesome. Glad to hear it, buddy. All right. Thank you, Alejandro. Thank you, Joshua. Thank you once again to my judges, Chris, Zach, Nicholas. I will sign off for now. That was a fantastic match. Be sure to check out the upcoming matches. We got Chad Webb versus Gritchy Goodacre. That's sure to be a barn burner as well. For Aaron Canole, I am Jake Tato. Have a fantastic night.